you know, we, we fulfilled orders of our initial crowdfunding campaign. We had about three months worth of supply in our warehouse based on daily sales run rate. And then um, without us doing any of our own marketing or sales, we started to see our daily sales double day on day. And after five days, we sold out of that complete three month supply that we had in our warehouse. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 120 of the Startup Playbook Podcast. I'm your host Rohit Pargava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have Simon Griffiths, the co-founder and CEO of Who Gives a Crap as my guest for this episode. But before we get into it, just a quick note from me. Saturday, the 18th of July marks four years since I published the very first episode of this podcast. It's been an incredible few years and I'm extremely excited to keep bringing you lessons and insights from some of the best founders and investors from around the world for many years to come. I'll be publishing a blog post that will outline some of the lessons that I've picked up from podcasting over the last few years, but I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of my previous podcast guests to date for trusting me to help tell their stories through the show, as well as a big thank you to all of you, whether it's your first download or your 120th, for taking the time to tune in and support the show. I'm extremely grateful to all of you, and it makes all the time that I've spent in putting the show together over the last few years extremely worthwhile. So thank you. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into this episode. So Simon is the co-founder and CEO of Who Gives a Crap, a subscription-based toilet paper, tissue, and paper towel company that donates 50% of its profits each year to help build toilets in the developing world. The company launched with a crowdfunding campaign in 2012, where Simon sat on a toilet for over 50 hours until they'd raised over $50,000, and the company has come a long way since then. They recently announced a $5.85 million donation to WaterAid, making it the largest donation that they've received this year, as well as the third largest behind Pepsi and HSBC globally over the last two years. In this wide ranging interview, we covered everything from Simon's decision to give up his dream job to capitalizing on viral growth strategies that have helped them break the $5 million donation milestone and everything in between. I really enjoyed this interview so much so that I completely forgot to ask Simon about their experience through COVID until after the Q&A session at the end of this episode. So I highly recommend sticking around till, until the end of this interview. It's definitely worth the wait. Without further ado, here is my interview with Simon Griffiths. Simon, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast and thanks so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. So Simon, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Um, uh, yeah, in, in how much time? <laughs> We've got time. Okay. Um, so I guess, I guess, yeah, the, the, the reason I'm here is that there's about 2 billion people that don't have access to a toilet globally. Um, so we realized this about 10 years ago, the number was actually a bit bigger, about 2.5 billion. And we realized that it was also one of the slowest development goals in terms of the progress. And that's because toilets are kind of gross and people don't like talking about them. They're not dinner party conversation. And as a result, you know, a lot of other um, development areas like clean water were improving incredibly quickly while toilets were something that was being left behind. And we looked at it and we also looked at the toilet paper industry and said, this is an industry that its marketing is fueled by puppies, pillows and feathers and things that are actually completely unrelated to the product. I think we can have a lot of fun by selling toilet paper, using the profits to help build toilets and calling it who gives a crap. And at the same time, allowing us to have a conversation about the product and what it's used for, as opposed to just relying on these, you know, these, these bears and other things that get used as kind of symbols of fluffiness. Um, and so that's how we started who gives a crap. And I think we're about, 10 years on from the idea today, we crowdfunded it eight years ago and started selling our first product seven years ago. Um, we've now donated yeah, about 8.3 million Australian dollars in that time uh, and yeah, helping hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Uh, obviously so excited to kind of dive into the who gives a crap story as well, but just wanted to start off by kind of jumping back uh, and we were speaking a little bit about this before we turned on the microphone as well. But uh, you did engineering and economics. You're the second person that I've ever met that did the same degree as me. Um, what, and, and, you know, obviously, like, I know that you have a sort of really interesting journey as well from kind of doing that degree and really wanting to get into McKinsey and getting the job and then not taking it in the end. Really wanted to kind of dive into, like, you know, what was that sort of 
early stages like in terms of, uh, you know, studying at, at uni and, and really having a very crystal clear path for you and then kind of deciding that that actually wasn't really what you wanted to do? Yes, yeah, so I was, um, I guess, you know, going back a bit further, I sort of at high school was that kid that would sell everyone's stuff. So um, I always had that sort of entrepreneurial spirit really like, you know, as part of my personality. And um, I also wasn't like necessarily super well behaved. And so I kind of, um, I got to university and um, didn't, I sort of underestimated like what I could do at uni. And I think I got there and actually started to get really good grades for the first time in, you know, like my whole life and was like, oh, there's something, there's something in this, you know, maybe, maybe if I work really hard, I can, um, you know, be quite good at this. And I think at university, particularly when I was there in the early 2000s in Australia, entrepreneurship was a bit of a dirty word. Like it wasn't something that was considered to be a prestigious, you know, career. Um, and so I sort of, in a way had my kind of blinkers put on and, and had the risk kind of beaten out of me, my risk loving nature beaten out of me. And by the end of my degree, I was like, Oh, you know, I can go and work at as an engineer or as a, a finance person in a bank or, you know, in a management consultancy. And so I kind of, they were sort of the, the jobs that everyone put up on a pedestal. And so I, I kind of tried them out. I worked briefly as an engineer. I worked briefly as an investment banker and didn't really like either of them. And so I was kind of you know set, setting my sights on management consultancy and, I think um, I worked really hard and sort of got the dream job offer. And, and when I, I did, I, I took a step back and said, well, is that actually the right thing for me if I haven't liked these other two jobs? And so I sort of unpacked why that was. And I realized that these other two jobs, that they weren't working on things that I actually really cared about. And um, so thinking about, you know, what that meant for me, I felt like I couldn't unlock the extra, you know, 30% of my potential and I was really kind of only performing at you know seventy percent of what was possible in these two jobs that I'd had, and so um, I started thinking about what I was really passionate about, and realised that you know as someone who'd gone to university on the east coast of Australia but grown up on Western Australia, um, I had a choice every holidays of you know where to spend the money that I'd earned during the term while I was working at university, and I realised that it was cheaper for me to to actually spend time in Southeast Asia than it was to go back to WA because. At the time, flights cost the same to Western Australia as they did to, say, Thailand. And obviously, the cost of living was a lot lower in Southeast Asia. And so I'd spent a lot of time in the developing world, um, living, traveling, doing development work. And I realized that I'd always thought that was a hobby, but I actually had the potential to turn it into something that could be a career. And so I ended up kind of turning down, um, you know, this dream job that I'd worked for and instead working in a non-profit so I kind of went you know completely the other direction moved to South Africa and worked on an education-based non-profit and I loved the outcome of the work that I was doing there but realized that this skill set that I'd built up at university was not actually being you know used and, and, and someone who um, was less you know had, hadn't had the same kind of time at university as me um, would be able to carry out my job probably better even than what I could have done and so I started thinking about you know, how I could apply the skills that I had and, and the, the other loves that I had around innovation and, and markets and, um, and doing business. And really that's when I realized that I could combine this passion of achieving outcomes in the developing world with those skills by working on businesses here in Australia and in, in, in the developed world, but using the profits to, to help achieve the outcomes that I was really passionate about. And so this is the third business that's kind of along that um, that same vision that from yeah the, the mid 2000s yeah and, and i think it's really interesting as well you know obviously and we'll jump into this uh, a little bit later into the interview but you know you just announced that you uh, donated 5.85 million uh, which is an, an incredible outcome and you know obviously for someone that's looking at your story now uh, it seems fairly straightforward, but you know, you just you just mentioned that there were sort of multiple, um, you know, different sort of business iterations um, and those sorts of things as well. And I guess just going back to, uh, you know, I think you mentioned in a previous interview that about sort of three months into working at that not for profit in in South Africa, you sort of realised that it wasn't letting you make the type of impact that you wanted and that you were feeling a little bit above your head. And I can imagine, you know, when you're in your early 20s and you've suddenly made this big decision of I've spent, you know, four to five years and kind of building towards this dream and it wasn't what I wanted and I've kind of jumped out into something else. And you have to go through sort of multiple iterations of a business at some point. Um, you know, I guess you must question uh, whether you're kind of doing the 
the right thing or whether it's kind of safer to go back or, or th- there's just, you know, um, a, a lot of sort of ongoing questions in terms of the decisions that you're making in the path that you're on. Talk us through what that sort of process was like for you in, in terms of kind of um, staying committed to what you were sort of passionate about and what your sort of vision was and it more being around the, the function and the type of way that you were able to do this rather than, I guess, pursuing that, that mission overall. Yes, I mean, I was I was lucky for a, a few different things. First of all, um, being in Australia meant that you know I had more of a safety net than what most people would um, around the world. But on top of that, I'd you know I'd worked um, in quite well-paying jobs for someone my age over my summers. So as an engineer, one summer and then as an investment banker, the other. And so I had a lot of cash in the bank, which meant that I could um, be a little bit more risk-taking with what my next move looked like. And I think that. I'd sort of ruled out the corporate pathway and said, I know that I don't want to do that. And that was quite a hard decision to make. Um, and so once I'd done that, it was more, there was definitely more kind of um, limitations placed on what the like opportunities were in front of me. Um, but I think the, like the approach that I took was, you know, very similar to a startup. It was like, how do I test whether my hypothesis on whether I will enjoy this is correct and, you know, validate that as quickly as I possibly can. <laughs> And so with each of those roles, it was, you know, three months was enough to kind of get a taste for it. And I also made sure I wasn't committing to more than that and leaving someone in the lurch by spending more time in that role. Um, but certainly, you know, my friends were like, what are you doing? My parents were like, well, you've got a great degree and you've had this job offer. Like, why didn't you take it? Um, and even, you know, this last week announcing the donation this year, the $5.85 million, it's, um, you know, there's been people this last week who've said, when you started this, I thought it was absolutely bizarre, but it's amazing to see that you've turned it into something that's genuinely having a lot of impact. So there are a lot of people that were, you know, sort of scratching their heads, I guess. Um, But yeah, for me, um, I guess I've always been a little bit stubborn as well. And I just knew that those other opportunities weren't the right thing for me. And I had to sort of find the thing that was right. Otherwise I would never be really happy myself. Um, And doing it in your early twenties is a great time no family, no mortgage for most people. So you've got the ability to take more risks than what you do later in your life. And if you have to, you can always go and get that, that other job back. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad I did it when I did, but uh, it's also not necessarily an easy path to go down. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I've spoken about this on the podcast before. A lot of my friends uh, actually had an intervention for me when I decided to quit my engineering job and um, jumped into my first startup. And uh, it can, you know, and a lot of that comes from sort of um, a place of love and sort of people caring about you. And, uh, you know, if you would objectively look at that in terms of the right decision, like they're doing the right thing by you more than anything else. Uh, But, you know, for for anyone who's kind of going through that process at the moment, um, like what were some of the the things that helped you get through that period where, um, you know, things weren't as obvious or things kind of weren't as clear um, or that you felt like, not that you had to justify it to other people, but I guess be comfortable in sort of the uncertainty down the, the path that you were, you were taking on. Was there anything that kind of helped you through that? Um, I think there was definitely, you know, you talked about friends and I, I, there's certainly, you know, a lot of my, my friends that had gone into more traditional jobs really didn't understand what I was doing. And so my friendship group sort of shifted towards friends who were um, tending to be going out on their own more. So Um, a lot more kind of people with kind of creative careers where they're sort of having to like make something um, and create, you know, that pathway for themselves. Um, A lot of small business owners, like my friendship group sort of shifted to people that were more empathetic with the challenges that I was naturally going through. And as a result, like on the sidelines cheering rather than saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, So that was a big one. I think the other big one was um, had to figure out how to, have enough money to, to survive. So um, one of the things that I did was I said, what's the highest hourly rate that I can earn? And I figured out that as a you know post university kind of undergrad student, I could tutor, but not only um, you know tutor during the day, I could actually tutor in the evenings at the colleges. And so I'd get paid really good hourly rates, but could do it all in, you know, after 5 p.m., which meant that I had still like a 40 hour week and regular hours to kind of work on my own stuff and then have an income coming in from that after hours work. Um, so I sort of set my life up so that there was, you know, there was more certainty around 
um, survival than I think what a lot of people can get into the, you know, credit card debt and all of that stuff, which was what I was trying to avoid. You know, one thing that's kind of um, really sort of strikes me from our conversation and obviously sort of doing a little bit of research uh, on you as well is like, there's a lot of thought that goes into, uh, into everything that you do. Uh, launching a toilet paper business isn't probably the most obvious thing that, that people would, would sort of think about. What was, um, what was that sort of initial stage of, of launching Who Gives a Crap? Like where did the original sort of concept or the idea of that sort of come from and, and what did the early days of that look like? Yeah, so as I said, this is kind of the third social business. So the first one was like a, a website that was a click to give and search to give website, um, which actually one of the Who Gives a Crap co-founders co-founded with me and a couple of other friends. The second one was a non-profit bar. And um, that taught me a lot of lessons because the non-profit business model was really challenging. And so that's where the 50% kind of twist on Who Gives a Crap's donation came from. But on top of that, I realized when that idea went from being kind of a pipe dream to something that was going to happen, um, that, you know, bricks and mortar businesses are inherently hard to scale. And so I started thinking about what, you know, what are businesses that, that anyone can use regardless of where they are. And um, was kind of thinking about that concept for a while. I think I saw Ethos Water in the States in, in the end of the 2000s sell to Starbucks um, and this is all, you know, pre Tom Shoes, pre Wobby Parker. No one was kind of in the buy one, give one space. So Ethos Water was kind of the first big sort of transaction that took place. And that made me, yeah, think about, you know, there's, there's some legs to this. Like if you can find the right consumer product, then um, you can really, you know, shift consumer behavior. And so uh, I was just kind of thinking about that concept. And then six months later, walked into the bathroom and saw a six pack of toilet paper and had that quarter second business idea epiphany that, um, you know, was let's sell toilet paper called who gives a crap and use the profits to help build toilets. And I called three friends straight away and they all said, you've got to do it. And the third friend was Jay Hunt, who's um, one of the co-founders who said, I've just wrapped up at, you know, my job at a management consulting firm. Let me come and help on this. I'd love to get involved. And so we met at a supermarket and we went and looked at, at the shelves and said, we think there's something in this. Like look at the other products that are here. It just, you know, the way that this is marketed doesn't make sense there's an opportunity here, let's give it a crack. And so that was how we got started. So it wasn't, it wasn't super analytical. I think that, um, you know, good decision-making in business typically has three things. There's, there's data, there's gut, and there's customer feedback. And so data, you know, you can analyze the category and you can analyze, um, you know, what the, the TAM and everything looks like. But um, this decision was really made off the back of this idea is so good that people are saying, why hasn't anyone thought of this before? Why hasn't someone done this before? And that gut reaction tells you that you're onto something. So um, that was kind of what led us to say, let's give this a crack and see if we can figure this out. Because back in 2010, you know, the, getting your first production run of toilet paper out the door was a lot more challenging than what it is today. There's you know, no Alibaba, like sourcing in China is not that common. Um, so yeah, we had to really kind of figure out how to do all that stuff from scratch. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you, you know, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but you launched who gives a crap through a crowdfunding campaign as well. And I think, um, you know, obviously there's, there's a funding aspect that comes into, into crowdfunding, but I think the critical component for new businesses or, or products with crowdfunding is actually the validation that you get from, from customers as well. And uh, again, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what did that sort of process look like? And I think you had a, a, a really interesting story about spending 50 hours on a toilet um, <laughs> during, during your sort of crowdfunding campaign as well. Do you want to share a little bit about what that story was like? Yeah. So I think, you know, crowdfunding was a big test for us where um, we tested, you know, a bunch of stuff earlier, brand names, whether people would buy online using Google ads, you know, from an online store that we'd set up. And we realized that we'd validated a lot of the assumptions that we thought were necessary to our success, but we couldn't get enough people coming through the store to really see, you know, how big is the, the level of interest in this. And so crowdfunding for us was this test of let's get a million eyeballs on it and see what, you know, what, what happens, what the conversion looks like, what, um, how people resonate with this, whether they're, they're going to talk to someone else about it, whether they think it's a good idea or a gross idea, what that looks like. And so, um, the crowdfunding campaign we set up uh, with sales going into both Australia and the U S as well. And so for us, it was a test of which market is the right market for us to focus on initially. And <clears throat> honestly, we thought the U S was going to be the right market. You know, it's a, a bigger market. 
online sales were much more common back in 2012. Um, and the idea of subscriptions as well was, you know, like quite well understood. And so we launched in, in both markets, but we found that, yeah, the Australian market actually had um, about, or I, sh I should say the other thing we did was we realized that, uh, you know, we were selling one of the most boring products in the world that probably that had ever been crowdfunded. And this was 2012, there'd been six $1 million crowdfunding campaigns prior to us launching. So Kickstarter was only just becoming a, you know, a household name um, and people hadn't figured out how to hack it in the way that they have today. You know, there's probably many million dollar campaigns getting launched every day at the moment. Um, and so we had to think about what we were doing a little bit differently in order to get people's attention. And one of the guys working on the campaign had the, the brilliant idea that we should shoot the whole thing with me sitting on a toilet and then I should pledge to not get off that toilet until we'd pre-sold the first $50,000 of product. And so that was kind of the hook that we thought would hopefully allow us to create some virality around the launch. And so, um, yeah, we launched and we found that not only was uh, the traffic much higher in Australia, I think it was about three times in Australia compared to what it was in the US, the conversion rate was also higher as well. So um, we realized that for some reason, the idea was more shareable in Australia. People were willing to tell other people about it, but it was also converting better. And so Australia became kind of the core focus for us as the first market that we went into. And we were always knew that, you know, this was an idea that to change the lives of millions of people would have to be global. So the US would always happen, but we wanted to focus on one market to learn about our customers, figure out production, build up a team, get our kind of team capacity and capability up before going and re-entering that market, which I think we did in 2016. Yeah. I, again, you sort of touch on a couple of things in terms of like shareability and, and virality. And I think that's such an important component for, for startups, especially when they're sort of so limited by, by resources um, is, you know, your customers will probably be your sort of biggest growth engine for your business. And I think um, who gives a crap got, you know, almost immediately from your sort of crowdfunding campaign, um, it seemed like a lot of people were, were sharing your, your products out on social. Uh, I guess, uh, again, it, it was, uh, I think you may kind of mentioned this previously, but you know, it wasn't something that you necessarily expected, but uh, I guess when you saw that happening, how do you sort of, um, I guess, like recognize that that's happening with your customer base? So you've got that sort of loyalty or engagement with them. And how do you sort of capitalize on that to make sure it's not just a, a one-off, but you can actually use that as, as a strategy moving forward? Yeah. So I think like a lot of startups um, will say, you know, we had this amazing idea and it like, it just took off. <laughs> and that, that is in, in essence what happened in this situation. You know, we said to ourselves, wouldn't it be cool if we could design a wrapper that was so beautiful people would take it out of the cupboard and be proud to put it on display. That was kind of one of the goals that we set. So in a way we did have this amazing idea and it actually played out. But the reality of an early stage startup is that was one of 50 different ideas that we were like putting out into the world, but it was one of the 50 that, that you know, maybe one of two or three of the 50 that actually really worked. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it'd be disingenuous to, to say like that was what we were going for and it took off if, for the founders out there we were trying everything and then focusing on the things that, that actually did work and so um when we saw you know we, we fulfilled orders of our initial crowdfunding campaign we had about three months worth of supply in our warehouse based on daily sales run rate and then um without us doing any of our own marketing or sales we started to see our daily sales double day on day. And after five days, we sold out of that complete three month supply that we had in our warehouse. And that was because our customers were, were taking roles and they were you know, taking them to work, giving them to colleagues, giving them to friends and family and posting photos of it on social media. And it was the first time that a toilet paper company had ever been, you know, like shared to Instagram as something that people were proud of from, from like a brand advocate point of view. And so we realized at that point that, we were really onto something. And so we started to think about, you know, what else can we do in uh, packaging, in how we're communicating to customers to create these moments that are unexpectedly delightful so that they'll want to take a photo of that, take a screenshot of that and want to share that moment with someone else, whether it's, you know, through WhatsApp or a text message or posting it to social media. And that's sort of become, yeah, something that we think about. And I think a lot of companies think about now, but probably back in 2012, it was, really you know not the norm um, and so the two kind of concepts we talk about there are packaging is a billboard so 
um, you know, every box that we sell is left on someone's doorstep and it's this mini billboard on their doorstep. If they display it in their bathroom, their friends will come around and see it and it's this mini billboard in their bathroom. If we do our job really well, then that packaging will get reused and gifted to someone else as wrapping paper or like turn into a bonbon at Christmas from, you know, the toilet paper wrappers around the core. So if we can do our job really well, then that billboard will continue getting, you know, shown in, in people's houses after the life of the product has ceased. Um, and then the other one is that, um, that, you know, to try and deliver unexpected delight. And the idea there is that you want to give your customer a frictionless experience through all of the core you know, parts of buying the product. So you want to have the least number of clicks to get through your website to, you know, go through the checkout. And once you've optimized for that, you can start putting little moments of delight through the customer experience that add that little bit extra compared to what you can get in a supermarket where you're just buying product on shelf that's wrapped in plastic and have to throw it in your boot or like carry it home under your arm, which is a bit of a pain in the ass. And so you can think about what are the touch points that we have that those companies don't have that we can start tweaking to make them really like beautiful, unexpectedly delightful customer experiences that, that people want to tell other people about. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, of the product, I'm proudly displaying it over my shoulder for anyone uh, looking at this live or, or watching back to the video. And I think this might be the first time that a, a podcast has a um, has toilet paper on on display. Uh, but you know, I, I guess it, it's a really interesting point around. You know, I, I guess there isn't that much that you can innovate on the product itself. Um, you know, toilet paper is is toilet paper. How do you, as as a business, sort of think about? Um, separating yourself out from from the market and also sort of continuing to stay ahead of the the game as well like in terms of defensively sort of bringing uh building moats around your your business um like what does that what does that look like for you as as kind of who gives a crap continues to grow and scale globally yeah so i think um you know, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. We probably think about the business as having lots of different moats. So there's like a brand moat, a design moat, an impact moat. Um, but, but the core kind of what you're getting at is that the product itself is actually pretty good. We don't need an eight ply toilet paper. Um, and so when we, when we realized that we said, you know, we think we can make an environmentally friendly toilet paper that's actually pretty good. And the innovation's everything that sits around that, the entire customer experience. And so that's the brand, the packaging, you know, the, the voice, um, the impact, all of the other bits and pieces, the delivery, the customer service. If we can get all of those bits right, then it builds, you know, many, many different types of moats around the product, which makes it much more defensible in the long run, but also a better customer experience because they're all customer experience innovations that improve, um, yeah, what it's like to, to buy toilet paper from us versus from someone else. Um, and so we kind of work on all of those things in, in different ways and are always, you know, pushing to continue making those better. And so in terms of kind of defensibility moving forward, you know, we, we're strong believers in innovation as defensibility. So always trying to continue improving on those things, always testing and learning, always doubling down on the things that are working and, and making everything better. Um, and so, you know, we're doing that at the moment with packaging where we've moved to like completely plastic free packaging. And I think the, the tape on the top of the boxes is the last piece of that that we're working through. Um, we've then gone into our warehouses and tried to remove all the plastic from our warehouses so that we have a stronger sustainability moat, but also just a more sustainable business, which we think is obviously like the best thing that we can be doing. Um, but then, yeah, we think about that through design. And so you know, we update our, our wrappers and our boxes on a regular basis. And then we launch two limited editions every year where we work with artists or illustrators to create um, a wrapper, you know, around kind of the end of the year with holiday season, but also mid-year we've got one launching tomorrow actually. Um, but if people are on our site today, they might see that. Um, and so we're kind of trying to always, um, yeah, push the boundaries, keep engaging people in different ways, refining what we're doing and, and getting better at all of the elements of the different parts of the customer experience. But probably the biggest one for us is the the impact and the sustainability element, which I think go hand in hand. You know, again, um, kind of taking a step back, one of the things that I think you've mentioned uh, previously was that you weren't actually quite sure whether, um, you know, following on from your crowdfunding campaign, whether people would actually buy um, products on, uh, buy toilet paper online. 
Uh, and I think you also mentioned that, you know, you expected um, to kind of pick up, potentially pick up a, a deal with sort of a Coles or Woolworths or, or some form of department store, and, and that didn't sort of quite pan out and you were forced to go online. But one of the other things as well that I was sort of really interested to find out through your journey was that um, you actually developed Role Model, which is uh, kind of more a, a B2B sort of play as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, like, what does that involve? And I guess, how do you sort of strike the balance um, or kind of devote focus between the B2B side of the business with um, with the core sort of B2C? Yeah, so I think, you know, when we, um, when we first did our kind of, like, I don't know if you'd call it market research, but we started talking to kind of, you know, mark marketing experts, great marketing brains about the brand name. We are, we had really polarizing feedback. Either people would say, I love it. It's amazing. Or they'd say, you can't do that. Like that is not okay for a toilet paper brand. And so um, we, t- we had, we took a step back and said, there's really smart people telling this, this is a bad idea. What are the other options that we could, you know, we could use here. And so role model came up as like a alternative brand name. Um, and when we did our early tests, we tested, who gives a crap and role model and found that people were fine buying something that was called who gives a crap. And so the crowdfunding campaign was the last test of if this works, we'll lock in the who gives a crap brand name. And so we launched that campaign and it worked and we were excited to, to launch who gives a crap. And then when we went, went and did um, some market research around B2B, so everything from, um, you know, SMEs up to like um, sort of like, high rise skyscraper type buildings uh, and then, you know, thousand person offices on a campus type setup. We found that a couple of things, one that um, there was some pushback on the brand name because it's a corporate environment and you've got one procurement person who's making the decision for thousands of people. And if you, um, if if they feel like they might get pressure on this, then they're not going to pull go on the contract. So we said, okay, you know, there's some more sensitivity there. On top of that, it's a more price sensitive environment because their KPIs are cost and not, you know, like ethics. And lastly, in in skyscrapers, um, they tend to have more sensitive plumbing because you've got many stories. And if you get a blockage somewhere in there, it can be quite expensive to fix or it can screw up the rest of the building. And so with all three of those things, we said, well, it makes sense for us to launch role model as a B2B brand that's a bit cheaper, a bit thinner tissue, so it disintegrates faster. And then um, we're not, you know, we know that the customer experience on that product won't be as good as our regular who gives a crap product, but because it has a different brand name, we won't have that, you know, the less good customer experience on a thinner product washing over to our kind of, you know, three ply consumer grade product that we want to be selling and building that brand online. Um, And so that was sort of where role model came from. And then the, the the supermarkets piece you kind of touched on as well. We certainly thought that, um, you know, when we started, again, direct to consumer wasn't a thing. I think Dollar Shave Club had launched their video six months before us. Wobby Parker was in the really early stages of kind of testing out their business. I think they just announced a funding round, maybe, you know, six or 12 months prior to, to us getting started. Um, so the co- direct to consumer wasn't actually called direct to consumer. It wasn't a thing in 2012. And so we thought strongly that, you know, online's cool, but it's toilet paper. It's not eyewear or razors, which are really easy to ship. Um, so we thought that supermarkets would be our kind of distribution path to, to scale. And uh, we kind of didn't get any attention from supermarkets on the initial crowdfunding campaign. So realized that you know, online would be where we were going to get started. But um, we thought that the B2B brand would be something that we could go on, you know, knock on people's doors to try and sell them to help build up demand and, and, and use that to ultimately allow us to get better at production, understand our customer more, and then, you know, continue having a crack at supermarkets. Um, but, you know, whilst kind of executing, we saw that our online sales just took off. And after 18 months, we were kind of looking at them going, if we keep going on this trajectory, we'll hit the numbers that we thought we could do with supermarkets in you know three years. That's probably a lot better than than having that supermarket contract and being beholden to a buyer. Um, and if we can get there, then you know we can still do supermarkets, but it'd be in a stronger position to negotiate when the time's right. Um, so we're still not in supermarkets today. We're in a lot of independent grocers and IGAs in Australia, um, but um, yeah, not the majors. But it's not something that we'd rule out. We'd love to do that, but the time just hasn't quite been right for us yet. 
you know, again, you kind of touched on the the branding element around the name specifically, but really curious to know just even from a, a brand messaging point of view for the business and kind of getting the the tone of voice correct for for a brand, it's it's really difficult juggling act. Um, and I guess especially when you're kind of in the impact space, um, you know, I guess there must be that sort of temptation to talk. Uh, a lot or focus a lot on the impact of the business. Um, but I, I think, you know, who gives a crap, obviously through the name, but also the, the way that you kind of speak to your, to your customers is very, um, is very sort of fun and engaging as well. Um, how do you like, you know, what did that sort of process look like in, in sort of finding what that right balance is for you? Um, and also like, you know, how do you sort of leverage that to, to kind of stand out? Because, um, it, it's something that like kind of really strikes me and, and you know, you kind of spoke about um, the innovation and, and moat around this. Like, I think that's one of the, the really interesting things that sort of engages the community around your business as well. Yeah. I think, um, you know, impact for us is like, you know, it's obviously the reason why we exist. So it's really important, but we also thought that, um, that people want to be made to feel good for doing good, first of all. So, we wanted to move away from how, you know, guilt based kind of marketing had been done in in the space prior. But on top of that, we felt like it was sort of the icing on top. Like people had to love the product and love the brand for what it was. And then impact was just like, you know, the icing on top, let's make, let's make it great. And then we can add this extra little cherry. Um, And so that's sort of how, how we thought about it, which means that it doesn't need to be a part of, every single message we want to have a brand that can be fun and engaging and and could potentially work without the impact although i don't think it would work as well um and then yeah we can kind of sprinkle the impact on at the right moments where we can really add value so um it's probably you know it's not something that we post about on our social media every month for example but we have these big moments through the year where you know we know we want to do like a big announcement around in a financial year with our donation and really kind of go deep at that moment and then for the people that do want to go deep, you know, throughout the year, we can have layers of information on our website. So there's a, a top layer that's very easy to digest. And then people can go deeper and deeper, depending on you know, how technical they want to get around what we're doing in the impact space. Um, and so that's, I guess, sort of how we've thought about it. Um, and then I guess, you know, the, the kind of thinking around that came from one of our co-founders, um, so three co-founders. Uh, Jehan comes from a management consulting background. Danny comes from a, um, a design background and design product design and design thinking. So he spent a lot of time at IDEO.org, the, the nonprofit consultancy. And um, that's a very kind of customer centric environment. So he's very good at thinking through, you know, what that, um, how, how we think about the customer experience on, on all of those elements and then pushed us very early to, to hire a creative director. Um, so one of our kind of, you know, first hires when we were less than 10 people i think was a creative director that has stayed with the business you know since for many years now and as a result we've been able to kind of put the creative team at the heart of the business to allow us to um, have those creative ideas permeate through all of the different parts of what we're doing Um, and so that's probably a different approach to what a lot of companies take yeah i mean um again really curious to know from your perspective just speaking on sort of hiring um people I guess for for more traditional businesses, there's kind of the the balance of you know investing into the growth of the business versus uh, the profit. But you have kind of a third layer of that almost, which is the the profit that gets kind of taken is is obviously shared with a third party and and sort of the the ongoing sort of impact um, for your business as well. So. Again, really curious to know um, in terms of decision making for you, when you think about, you know, do we invest in something that will bring sort of more longer term growth for the business and and as a result, the the impact that we can provide versus the short term profit that we know that we can sort of provide to our partners like WaterAid. Um, How do you... Um, how do you balance those kind of decisions or, or what's the process that you follow to understand when you should invest and when you should focus a little bit more on the profitability side? Yeah. So I think like what we come back to with everything is that, um, you know, the, the purpose of our company is to make sure everyone in the world has access to a toilet. And that's kind of our 30 year BHAG that we work towards. So 2050, everyone in the world having access to a toilet, we can kind of do the back of, back of the envelope math to figure out what that means in terms of the impact that we have to have between now and then. And then we come down to what does that mean in the next five years that we need to do? And then what does that mean that we need to do this year in order to get us to the five years to get us to that 30 year BHAG that we have? 
And so when we kind of look at it like that, you know, we have this 30 year horizon, but in the next year, we also need to hit certain revenue and certain donation targets in order to allow us to be on the right trajectory in terms of revenue and allow us to engage the customer in terms of impact. Because if we're a loss making business, that's not making donations, then that's not super exciting from a customer who's buying our products because we're donating 50% of our profits. And so they're kind of the constraints that we have and how we look at, you know, the lenses we use to look at how we make different decisions. Um, and then I think, you know, we kind of try to keep it simple. So if we know that we're trying to double revenue every 12 months, then we know that we can roughly double headcount and keep our kind of cost structure in a fairly you know, similar place to where it has been. Over time, we know that we want to get improve that cost structure. So over time, you know, we'd start to grow headcount less quickly than what we're growing the, the revenue of the business. And so that's sort of how we, we think about most parts of, of what we're doing. We try not to stay focused on what's happening this month or this quarter in terms of costs, because we know that that will wash out, you know, we're a high growth business that will wash out in time. And we need to be investing for growth in terms of, um, you know, how we're um, resourcing the team, but also the kind of types of initiatives that we're testing. So we do test, um, you know, we have taken out ads in, in the, the newspapers this year um, for the first time. So we're constantly testing, you know, different marketing channels and doing some, some fairly big budget stuff. Um, and, and we'll definitely be on television and all of that stuff in the future, but it's really like finding the right time where we can take that next step and ratchet up based on, you know, knowing that if we go too early, then um, we might impact the profitability of the business too much in the next year, which is something that we want to avoid doing. So it's, constantly testing, learning, taking baby steps, going bigger on the things that are working and just continually, yeah, ratcheting it up month after month. Yeah. Um, taking baby steps. I uh, recall sort of listening or kind of hearing that uh, you actually launched into the U S and the UK at the same time. Yep. <laughs> And, you know, usually, um, I, I guess the, the way that most people would sort of think about this is, you know, we've got to pick one and, and sort of stick to that. But I think it was really interesting that you mentioned that it was actually one of the, the better decisions that you made when you, that you did decide to kind of do both at the same time. Again, do you want to unpack that a little bit in terms of like, what were some of the insights that you were able to, to glean from doing both at the same time that potentially you wouldn't have been able to if you only launched in one? Yeah, so I guess we had we had hypotheses of around which market would perform better, um, but and that was probably the UK. You know, it's more from a language perspective, it's closer to Australia. The sense of humour is closer to Australia. It's also just an easier market to operate in. Um, so we we kind of assumed that the the UK would be an easier market for us, but. We had Danny, who is American in America. We had American teammates already. You know, America was kind of the next, the, the easiest place for us to put down feet next because we didn't have anyone in the UK. Um, and so there was reasons to do, you know, both markets. Um, and I guess, yeah, typically a company would say, let's do one market, learn from that. And then, you know, we can take that learning into the next market. But when we looked at it, you know, if we went into the U S which we knew was the harder market and it didn't work, then we would have said we should have gone to the UK because it would have been easier. And if we went to the UK and we were having trouble because we didn't have people on the ground, we would have been saying, well, we should have gone to the U S because it would have been easier. And so we said, let's do both markets at the same time. And that will show us what's, what's a, a geographic issue that we're having in one country versus what's a systemic issue that we're having because we're doing new geographies for the first time. And I think what we saw was that a lot of the issues that we had were systemic. And if, if we weren't doing both markets at the same time, we would have most certainly said it's a geographic problem. We should have been in the other market, you know, the grass is greener. And so we um, were able to, you know, keep ourselves more level headed because new, new markets take a long time to kind of, you know, come together and, and start turning into, into the high growth markets that you want them to be. And so we were able to be more patient by seeing that, you know, the challenges we were facing, we're just a new market challenge that's systemic to what we were trying to do. Um, so it was a really, a really good exercise in, um, I think, you know, quite a bizarre strategy from the outside that was actually really effective from the inside. Interesting. Like what, what were, I guess, some of the metrics or, or things that you identified to sort of realize that they were more sort of systemic issues rather than, than sort of market conditions? 
Yeah, I mean, for us, it was really around. Um, so, so something that that's really interesting with our product in particular is um, people when we go into a new market, particularly an English speaking market, um, there is some pushback on the brand name because people aren't used to seeing a brand name that is a little bit rude. And, you know, our brand name is the rudest part about our business. We will never write copy that's ruder than our brand name. But um, I think if we, you know, when we went into, um, into the US and the UK, we knew that it would be a problem in the US, but we didn't think it was going to be a problem in the UK. And it was actually a problem in both markets, which was really interesting. And it, it was something that we hadn't thought about too much, but in the early days of who gives a crap, it was actually a problem as well. And then we sort of hit critical mass and people started to accept that, you know, we who, who are who we are and got to know our brand a little bit more. And it's something that people don't really complain about that much anymore. And we were actually just seeing that in both of those markets and in time that went away and now it's not something that pops up too much. But I think if we were just doing one of those markets by itself, we would have said, particularly the US, we would have said, this is a brand name issue and we need to like potentially think about rebranding in this market because it's going to hold us back from our growth. But seeing that it was also happening in the UK where we weren't, weren't expecting it um, meant that, yeah, we could say, well, actually let's think about this. Let's give it some time. We're probably just seeing the same thing that we saw in, in the early days of Australia that we had forgotten about. I mean, I don't want to get into hypotheticals, but like you, you did sort of mention that, you know, when you first launched, who gives a crap as well. Like it was a very polarizing name. Like people either loved it or hated it. And I guess if you had, um, if you had picked another name, like role model, which I guess is is a little bit um, less polarizing in, in that sense. Do you think that um, who gives a crap would have been as successful in, in terms of standing out from the market? I guess what, what I'm trying to unpack is like, you know, how important was it for you to have, kind of those extreme points of view or, or have people be that sort of connected to, to something that sort of um, while being willing to, to forego the people that, that didn't quite resonate with the brand name. Yeah. I think that, um, I think that, you know, when we think about what, what creates an idea where people go, this is so good. Why hasn't done, someone done it before? We think about the lockup between the brand name, the product and the cause and th that sort of triangle. Um, and so if you take one, it's like a three legged stool. If you take one of those elements away, the stool would fall over and that's certainly how we think about it with, um, you know, what that lockup looks like. So you could probably change the brand name and it would appeal to some people, but I think there's something unique about what we, what we did with the who gives a crap name that has really resonated that I think has enabled us to be more successful than we otherwise would have been. So role model probably would have worked and, and, and the concept would work without, you know, without the impact piece in there, but I don't think, you know, if you take one of those three elements away, it's not going to be as successful as what it is as it is today. And, you know, obviously we've kind of mentioned a couple of times um, the $5.85 million donation, which again is, is a huge achievement and sort of congratulations for uh, not just having kind of that, that impact, but being able to be a bootstrapped company and being profitable and um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> having, having those kind of Im impacts as well. Like, you know, it's, it's amazing. And I think a very inspiring story for a lot of people to, to really sort of learn from um, and re realize that, that, that that's something that they can do as well. Um, you know, again, from a, from a business perspective and I guess from a social um, perspective as well, how important has it been for you to be sort of transparent with those type of numbers um, or kind of transparent in terms of the, the organization as a whole um, in being able to make customers feel really comfortable um, that when they do sort of make a purchase that, that they are um, being able to sort of make an impact and, and kind of know um, that they're having a positive impact every time they, they use the product. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important. I think um, you sort of hit the nail on the head there. The, um, the, um, because we, because we're a company that says that it will do good. I think that we get held to a higher standard than companies that, you know, are just out there to make money. So if you look at all the other toilet paper companies, they're not getting asked the same questions that we get asked because our customers, you know, want to really verify that we're actually doing what we say that we will do. And so, um, we realized that early on and we knew that that was part of the impact moat, part of the sustainability moat that we have in our business. And so we needed to, um, to cultivate, you know, trust in our customer in order for them to really believe in what we were doing. And so um, our kind of tactic, the way that we've dealt with that is to 
put as much information as we can on our website to answer a lot of those questions that will come in. So with this donation, for example, we have letters from you know, every partner that we've donated to verifying the donation amounts. You know, people can actually pick up the phone and call Waterhead and say, hey, I just want to check, is this, is this, you know, this number that you've said who gives a crap's donated to you, is that actually true? And they will verify it over the phone. And so we've done a lot of work there to um, get out on our front foot to make sure that you know, we don't, have, first of all, have more customer inquiries coming in than what we're able to deal with so that customers can self-service and, and answer some of those questions themselves, but build up trust and allow them to go deeper in other areas and see how we do think through all of the different parts of the business because there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And when we get that right, we actually see, you know, on social media, it's a great example where someone will ask, you know, but why do you do this? And another customer will jump in and link out to one of our FAQs or a blog post where we've kind of gone into detail around how we think about that particular element of what we're doing. Um, and so we found that we have an abnormally high level of trust for, um, especially for a toilet paper company, and that can result in some incredible things. So I think one of my favorites was um, in the very early years, we got sent a photo of um, this couple who'd got married, but instead of having a wedding cake, they had a who gives a crap cake and they had rolls of our toilet paper that were giving out to all of their guests. And that's something that, you know, like no other toilet paper company in the world will ever kind of be able to do something like that. But it's because we're able to build that trust in our customer and create something that they want to tell someone else about that, um, yeah, makes it possible to have those really special moments. Um, and final question for me uh, before we jump into audience Q and A um, is, uh, I guess, as as a founder, as a CEO, how do you sort of measure the impact of of everything that you're sort of doing as a business? What are kind of key sort of metrics or key things that that you sort of follow to make sure that you're on the right track? Um, yeah, so I guess um, you know, in many ways, like we're, we're from an impact perspective, we're kind of lucky that we've tied impact to to profit because that's one of, you know, like the traditional sort of metrics that a business would use. So for us, you know, we've talked about revenue and profit being kind of really good sort of guide guidelines for how we're going on in terms of where we're, where, where we are on track to hit our five and 30 year visions. Um, I think then, you know, culture is obviously a massive one. So we use culture Ant to help us with all of our engagement surveys um, and then, you know, going deeper into our 360s as well. We're kind of using the, the kind of full culture and product. Um, so that's probably a massive metric. And then um, company wide, at least. And then, you know, every function, I think, has their own metrics that we've worked with to help us determine how they're going on a reporting basis, but also hopefully give leading indicators to other parts of the business about what they're about to see come through the pipeline. And so we've kind of lined up our metrics so that, you know, it goes from, I think, starting with um, our growth team right down to, um, you know, our customer service team who are dealing with an inquiry after an order has been fulfilled. So it's sort of like sale happens, you know, or production happens, the sale happens, we fulfill the order. And then, you know, there might be challenges that our customer happiness team has to deal with. And so we sort of set the metrics up so that, you can sort of see how we're flowing right through the business to, um, yeah, not only tell the the management team what's going on, but we do that in a way that anyone can jump into those Slack channels and get a feel for what's happening and to the point where, you know, they can even see how much cash we have in the bank. Um, so that's something that we're super transparent about with the team because um, we just believe that transparency is kind of the best way to operate. Speaking of transparency, I have uh, run well over time um, on, on my side of the interview, but I did, I did warn you that we might run a little bit over time, Simon. So thank you for, for being gracious with your time. We'll uh, shift gears to audience Q&A. So uh, once again, thank you to all of you that have already submitted questions. If you have, uh, for those of you that are tuning in live, if you have questions, um, there's a little Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen um, and I'll pick out a handful of these questions. So the first one comes from Georgie Armstrong who wants to know, it's incredible that you bootstrapped the business. How did you weigh up proceeding unfunded and how long did you manage to bootstrap with a team of what size before becoming profitable? Yeah. So I think um, this is a funny story. I haven't, I haven't told this to the, I don't know if the person that is on the other side of this story knows how, um, how impactful it was, but we, when we did our first production run, you know, from the crowdfunding campaign, we sold out quite quickly and then we had to triple down our order volume um, to make sure that we had enough stock because we realized that there was more interest than what we originally thought. We had enough money to pay the deposit on that three times sized order. 
but we didn't have the remaining 70% of the order that we needed to, to pay the balance when it was due to land in you know, eight to 12 weeks. Um, and so that was about $50,000 that we needed to find to like keep us, you know, solvent essentially. Um, and so um, I actually had coffee with someone that I thought, you know, would potentially be interested in, in funding our business and, and taking an equity stake. And he, he, I told him the story of where we were at and he said, you know, before asking anything and he said, wow, you guys are doing an amazing job. If you just get a little bit further, you'll, you'll be break even and you'll be able to just continue running without being beholden to investors and, you know, have more control over the company and be able to continue growing it so that you can give up less at the point where you do want to take capital in the future. And so instead of asking him if he was interested in giving us money, I just said, you know, that's awesome advice. Thank you. And went away and thought about it. And luckily, I think a week after that, um, I was having coffee with someone about, you know, how do we get the, the a philanthropist? How do we get money out of the business in the most tax effective way with the donations we're making? If some of the organizations we're funding don't have a tax deductible status in Australia. Um, and he helped me with that problem and then said, you know, what else are you working on? And I said, oh, we've also got this, you know, $50,000 toilet paper problem that I need to solve. And he's like, well, if you ever want to talk about that, you know, maybe I can help there. And so we had a coffee about that. And three weeks later, he wrote us um, a, a piece of a debt, basically, that um, was, you know, unsecuritized, that um, was at an interest rate that was close to commercial rates. But he was still doing us a favor, honestly. But most importantly, he said, you know, this interest, instead of paying it to me, you'll donate it to a water-based charity of my choice. And so when the quarter's up, let's calculate the interest and I'll tell you where you're going to send it. And so for us, it was a no-brainer to take that capital on because it actually made us more impactful than if we were taking capital from a bank or from, you know, any other investor, basically. And so we used his debt um, with an 18-month maturity, uh, but we repaid it in five months. And he said to us, what, like, I've never seen anyone repay debt that quickly you know, you guys are onto something. If you need more money, let me know. And so um, we actually ended up taking, you know, over many years, um, a total of up to, I think, $800,000 from that, that one individual. Most of it came from his foundation and it allowed his foundation to create more capital to invest in causes that we really care about. And um, that got us to the point where we could repay all of the debt in May of 2019. So, um, it took, yeah, about um, six years. It, when we originally modeled it out, I think it was more like three years, but the assumption was that we were just running from the warehouses that we had with that original three-year model. And every time we opened a new warehouse, it created more working capital requirements. We run nine warehouses globally now, um, and all of those warehouses have to have stock in them that you know we own. Um, and so that kind of pushed out the the time that we, you know, the cash shortfall from three years to, to six years. Um, and yeah, it's great to be now debt free and be able to make this, you know, $5 million donation without having to take on more debt. Yeah. Um, I, I think you've pretty much answered the, the next question that I was going to ask from the audience Q&A, which is from Tony Tan, who wanted to know, I'm um, just wondering if fundraising was ever on the cards and what the response was like, I guess, really curious in terms of moving forward, when you sort of think about sort of the impact and, and the growth of the business, is that something that you think that you will be able to sort of continue doing um, on a bootstrap basis or, or from some, some form of venture debt? Or do you think that, um, you know, potentially there's, there's um, sort of opportunities for you to sort of look at more traditional sort of investing in, in the business moving forward? Yeah. And I should say, just to wrap up the last question, um, there was a headcount question in there. I think, you know, that got us to about, you know, 40 or 50,000, 40 or 50 staff before we um, repaid all of the debt. But yeah, so in terms of financing, when we first started, we were like really gung ho on, you know, like let's go and get some capital. Um, we also want a business plan, like a, a social business incubator in the US and there was a business plan competition in there. And from that, we want a piece of convertible debt that, um, that we had in our business. And that convertible, you know, was done on a like fairly traditional kind of American style kind of time horizon. But um, growing a business in Australia is quite different to growing a business in America. And so the time horizon, the trigger to convert, like all of the kind of core parts of the term sheet weren't really aligned to what we thought was the right way to grow a business in the Australian environment. And so we ended up buying that investor's debt, you know, convertible debt back from them at a very slight premium so that they still, you know, made a little bit of interest essentially on, on their convertible. But it taught us that 
we need to be really careful with um, who we took money from, making sure that they were aligned to the horizon of the business and, and what we were trying to do with it from a mission perspective as well. Um, and so because of that, we were like more cautious about taking capital than, than what we originally had been. And so we, um, we did have a little bit of interest, but you know, not, I think again, the direct consumer space like Dollar Shave Club had only just been funded. Warby Parker was like a breakthrough kind of, you know, funding announcement that you could potentially fund consumer packaged goods company with venture style funding. So in 2012, um, yeah, there just wasn't the same type of funding available for, for consumer products as what there is today. Um, interesting. So we, we kind of, you know, decided to, to bootstrap it because we thought that was possible. Interestingly, I think in the last 24 months, you know, we've really started to get a lot of inbound inquiries from investors. Um, so there is a lot of interest in the market in, in the space and what we're doing in the space, um, which is great. Um, but we had a really funny conversation with, you know, quite a, um, a well-known uh, investor in the Valley who's actually friends with, with Jayhan from many years ago. And he said to us last year, you know, like when you guys started this six years ago, I was thinking, what the hell are you doing? Like, this makes no sense at all. But now, like, you know, you've clearly built something that's, that's incredible and, and um, there's a lot of interest in kind of how you're going about it. So um, it just sort of highlighted that when we started, raising capital would have been really hard, but now we're at a scale where, yeah, the, the appetite's very different. So that option is there for us. Um, do we want to take it? I think it comes down to, you know, a mix of, where we're trying to get to in that 30 horizon and what's the right capital strategy to make that happen for us. And that's something that um, we revisit every, you know, probably 12 months to think about what makes sense for us in the, in the years ahead. Um, and the answer at the moment is that we're happy as we are. Yeah. Sometimes having constraints forced on you, um, like funding not being there or, or not having those um, sort of deals from calls of Woolworths coming through um, sometimes work out as, as the best possible um, sort of yeah. for the business as well. Um, next question I'm going to pick is from Cynthia Wu who wants to know uh, what's next strategically for who gives a crap uh, more toilet paper market share or another paper product. And I know that you've got two other sort of product lines as well. So I guess more broadly, how do you sort of, when you think about the growth for, for the company, um, how do you sort of think about sort of, further embedding yourself in the market versus looking at opening up more revenue channels. Yeah. So we sort of think about like there's kind of new geography is one way to do that. So we think about, you know, Europe where we're testing now, we're in Canada now as well. And then the U S and the UK. So we'll keep working on new markets and then um, there's new products. So we're doing some stuff under the who gives a crap brand now, which is really exciting. And then we're going to try a, a different, a different category outside of, of paper and toilet paper in particular, um, in the next 12 months and see how that goes. So that's sort of what we're working on now, but I can't say too much more about it than that. Cool. And final two questions before we wrap up. Uh, the first one is from Sabine Tejerina, uh, who wants to know, did the founding team include a marketing person? If not, what number employee was the marketing person? Um, so founding team didn't have a marketing person, but it, it, you know, I think like most entrepreneurs, like they wear the sales hat and the marketing hat fairly well um so um yeah in the early days that was just me and and you know i should never have been running our social media accounts for example but um then danny you know one of the co-founders he rejoined the business um after i'd sort of worked on it for a couple of years prior and had that kind of customer lens and i think marketing is all about customer experience how you make someone feel and how you make someone think and if you can put yourselves in the shoes of the customer, then you can generally do a pretty good job of that. So Danny kind of took the reins on that front. And then we brought yeah, a creative director in probably at about 10 people. Um, and that's the same creative director that we've got in the business today, you know, in a different role, but um, it must be, you know, probably three or four plus years on. And final question before we wrap up, and obviously we've sort of spoken about bootstrapping and, and having to sort of do things on, on a limited budget. Um, so final question comes from Nina Nigam, who wants to know, how do you market your business without generating revenue? Or I guess when you have sort of limited resources, how do you um, make sure that you get the biggest bang for buck? Um, I mean, I think like marketing sort of changes depending on what, like what stage of the business you're at. So for us, you know, we actually didn't turn on any advertising for, the first two years of the business and we just use the organic word of mouth kind of flywheel that we built into 
all of the parts of the customer experience and that, you know, propelled us forward at like three X growth year on year for the first two years. Um, and then once we, we had to grow that slowly or, you know, without turning on ads because we were literally just trying to build the systems and pave the road before we were driving down it. And again, in 2012, you know, Shopify was not the best infrastructure. There was lots of kind of challenges that we had to overcome to be able to actually sell product in a way that was a, a decent customer experience. Um, and so when we kind of paved enough road for us to drive down and given us a bit more room, then we could turn on ads. And so, um, you know, I think when you're doing that for the first time, you want to look at ads that are going to give you a really direct return on the money that you're putting in. So, um, you know, Facebook and, and kind of, um, Google are, are great places to do that because you can track the sale and make sure that you're profitable on every sale that's coming through those platforms. So um, you can then use that to build up, you know, more and more traffic. And then as your kind of returning customers come through, you start to be able to build up a bit more capital to be able to play within other channels that are less easy to track. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at as a business now where we can start to move into less kind of performance focused or, or direct response channels. and um, see the benefits of that come through over a longer time period. Um, and I did say that was going to be the last question, but I am going to say that that was a lie um, because I just had another question that was submitted and I realized that we didn't even talk about COVID at all yeah. um, and, and around the impact of, of your business. So, uh, you know, I, I guess one of the things that, um, that was really sort of interesting around COVID was obviously uh, the hoarding that, that took place, especially around sort of the initial lockdown period. Melbourne's now in lockdown again. Um, and, uh, you know, really curious to know sort of what the impact was from your business. I, I think you've mentioned, um, previously or through kind of subsequent tweets that, you know, you had 500,000 people on the waiting list. So my question is, uh, you know, how did you sort of think about the balance of, um, uh, you know, providing ongoing value and service to your existing customers versus servicing these potential new customers that were, that were waiting to, to utilize your product? And a, and a follow-up question, um, which was submitted from one of the audience Q&A is, um, you know, did the effect of COVID uh, bring forward your 30-year time horizon as well? Um, yeah, so I think, did it bring forward the 30-year time horizon? No, like it got us to slightly, you know, a slightly higher end, end of year revenue number, which will help a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I, like maybe a tiny bit, I guess. But um, yeah, so what we saw happen through COVID was, was pretty wild. Um, right, I've just forgotten the first question. Can you remind me? Yeah, so, you know, obviously with, with COVID, you had uh, sort of half a million people that were added to your waiting list just during the sort of excess kind of craziness that, that happened with lockdown. Um, you know, there was no one could get access to, to toilet paper at all. And you had an existing base of sort of customers that were sort of already uh, using your product and were loyal to you. And then you've suddenly got 500,000 people that are waiting to, to utilize your product as first time customers. You know, how do you sort of balance out uh, servicing your existing customer base versus uh, onboarding potential new customers who would then sort of go on to become potentially lifelong customers of the product? Yeah, so I think like we always put ourselves into, into the shoes of the customer. So I talked earlier about, you know, decision making really is like data, gut and customer feedback. Um, and in this instance, this is probably a balance of, of gut and customer feedback. You know, we know... Um, and, and, and the promise that we make to our subscribers as well. So we know that, you know, running out of toilet paper is like the worst thing that can happen to you with, with our product essentially. Um, so we want to make sure that people who are our existing customers and especially subscribers who, you know, sign up for regular delivery and want to never run out of toilet paper again, that they're given priority because it's, it is a bit of a rubbish customer experience. If you've been really loyal to this company you're a subscriber then you know you definitely need to get product but even if you're not a subscriber maybe you're just not a subscriber because you travel a lot but you know your buying habits are just as just as good as what a typical subscriber would be you just have less predictable delivery frequency and so you don't want to subscribe and so we said we need to make sure that we're looking after those people um you know that's the kind of the 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 gut piece um i think that the data piece there is you know, people would say that it's cheaper to retain a customer than it is to acquire a new one. Um, and so, you know, we also, um, yeah, we, we, we want to make sure that we're kind of continuing looking after those returning customers. Um, and so I think we realized that, um, 
we could make a lot of, you know, potentially a lot of sales to new customers in a short period of time, but we had to really make sure we we're looking after our existing customers before we got to those new customers. Um, but yeah, overall, I think we ended up kind of turning our website into an invite only version of its store. Um, we repacked a lot of our bigger 48 roll boxes into smaller 24 roll boxes. So we had twice as many orders we could send out and that enabled us to hit, you know, and, and also I think we hired 25 freelancers and trained them in a week to be able to answer customer inquiries. And that enabled us to hit a much larger percentage of that, that email list um, as quickly as possible to try and get, you know, as many people as possible through, through the business and service both the, the returning customers, but also hopefully add some new ones in there. Um, and so I think we ended up adding in more new customers in that time period, probably than what we would have done maybe even over the rest of the year, um, just because it was a, you know, like a, a bit of a, a, a black swan event for, um, for toilet paper as well as the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, I like, I feel like I could talk to you for, for days, but I'll, I'll promise this will be the last question uh, for me. Um, you know, what, what did that, sort of feel like as well you know obviously you've you've touched on sort of who gives a crap sort of growing 50 60 percent year on year uh, for the business which is um an incredible sort of growth rate but you know i can imagine that uh you know covid just provided even on top of that uh sort of a hockey stick layer on a very condensed sort of timeline as well and you know if you speak to any founder those are um, those are the things that you kind of magically wish that they kind of happen, but also come with a set of challenges as well. But can you talk yeah. about what, like, you know, again, what does that sort of look like from someone who's sort of running a toilet paper company to suddenly that being the most important thing that, that sort of people are, are looking for or, or want access to? Yeah, I think it was a really challenging moment. I mean, we, we normally grow, yeah, at about a hundred percent year on year typically. Um, so we're kind of used to, to high growth, but um, you only hold a certain amount of inventory in your business at any time. So you can't deal with these like extreme spikes. And we were seeing, you know, we saw, I think in Australia, we saw on one day, a hundred percent increase in daily sales, the next day, a 400% the day after an 1100% increase. And it looks like the day after that was going to be like a 3000 or 4000% increase on sales. So you're doing, you know, four or five, even a week of sales in a, in a, um, sorry, more than that, uh, like, a week and a half of sales in a day, you know, potentially even a month or more of sales in a day on those extreme days. And so we, um, we realized that we just weren't built to deal with volume that big. And so we had to move our store to sold out. And that was, um, you know, I think our team would describe the last few months as being uh, exhausting, but exhilarating. It was like, you know, like so much was happening at work, but then also at home with everything that was going on around shutdowns and families at home and all of the other bits and pieces but we also recognized that, you know, that was our time to shine as a toilet paper company. And if we got it right, a lot of good would come out of that at the, at the end of the period. Um, and so our kind of thoughts actually went to our partners because we knew that, you know, our partners are working on hygiene and sanitation, but a lot of the places that they're in, they don't have access to soap and, and water. And so we're kind of stressed out about the impact of COVID here in Australia or the US or wherever we are. But um, yeah, our partners are going to have a really like, you know, massive challenge dealing with that. And then the other kind of impact that we hadn't thought about was that, you know, the financial impact of COVID then meant that our partners also weren't going to be able to get the same donations that they would normally get because people are now going to be tightening up their purse strings. Um, and so this donation that we were able to make this year was quite amazing because we were able to, you know, fill some of the shortfall that was coming in from the financial implications of COVID for our partners that we were donating to but also enable them to um, really get on the front foot with their COVID response. So we released some of those funds early kind of in you know, March to be able to um, help them with their COVID response in the communities that they were working in. Fantastic. On that note, Simon, uh, thank you so much for your time, for your extended time today um, on the podcast this morning. For anyone that wants to find out more, say hello, get in touch. What's the best way for them to do that? Um, yeah, Twitter's probably best. So just Simon Griffiths uh, is my Twitter handle. Um, LinkedIn, you know, messages. I kind of read everything that comes through. So um, those are probably the two best spots. Perfect. Simon, once again, thank you for coming on and sharing your experience and insights this morning. Uh, it's been fascinating. And uh, thank you again to all of you for, for taking the time to, to tune in and join us this morning as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's great. Yes, bye. Thanks for listening to episode 120 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. 
I'll be back at 8 a.m. next Tuesday, the 21st of July with another live episode. And my guest for episode 121 is Robert Bell, the CEO of 86400, Australia's first smart bank. I'm really looking forward to this interview and hope that you can join us. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.